right now when I won't wait for your emergency. <laughs> this is Alec Murdoch at 4147 Moselle Road. I need the police to pass us immediately. My wife and child just stopped badly. Okay, you said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Sir? You said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Yes, sir. 4147 okay. Moselle Road. Stay on the line with me, okay? Hurry. Yes, sir. Stay on the line with me, okay? Okay. Con County Communications. Collison, I have an Alex Murdoch on the line, caller from 4147 Moselle Road. He's advising that his wife and child was shot. Okay, and sir, give me the address again. It's 4147 Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Are they in a vehicle? No, ma'am. They're on the ground out at my kennel. <laughs> okay. And did you see anyone? Okay. Is he breathing at all? No. No. Is she? Okay. Do you see anything? Do you see anyone in the area? No, ma'am. Oh, ma'am. What color is your house on the outside? What color is your house on the outside? Uh, it's white. You can't see it from the road. Okay. Is it a house or a mobile home? It's a house. Okay. And what is your name? My name is Alex Murdoch. Okay. Did you hear anything or did you come home and find them? No, ma'am. I've been gone. I, I just came back. <laughs> Okay, and was anyone else supposed to be at your house? No, ma'am. Please hurry. We're getting somebody out there to you. Okay, what is her name? Maggie, Maggie and Paul. That was the voice of the seemingly distraught Alex Murdar as he is standing over the lifeless bodies of his wife and child. This next piece of body cam footage was taken from a first responder only minutes after the phone call took place. Central 717 Senior Security. Got a Whiskey Fox, Whiskey Mike, both gunshot wounds to the head. I want to let you know because of the scene, I do. I did go get a gun and bring okay. it down here. It's in your vehicle. It, I just you have any guns on you at all? Leaning, no, sir. It's leaning okay. up against the side of my car. Okay. You're you're fine, man. You're fine. Turn around for me. I don't have any. Gun. Okay. Yes, sir. I see that. Okay. This is your wife and son. And son. Okay. It's bad. It's bad. Check the pulses. Yes, sir. <laughs> This is the firearm you brought from inside the house? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I went get. This is a long story. On the evening of June 7th, 2021, Alex's son Paul and his wife Maggie would visit their dog kennels only a short distance away from their house. At 8.48 p.m., Paul would send a text from the food storage building adjacent to the kennels. Seconds later, Paul would be shot in the chest with a 12-gauge shotgun. Surprisingly, he would survive this first attack. Paul would then struggle to his feet and likely try to escape. This was until he was shot with a 300 blackout rifle through the neck and skull, killing him instantly. Four minutes after the initial attack on Paul, his mother Maggie would search for and find his body. She was then shot five times from a close distance with the same 300 blackout rifle. My son was in a boat wreck a few months back. He's okay. been getting threats. Most of it's been benign stuff we didn't take serious. Okay. Um, you know, he, he's been getting, like, punched. Um, I know that's somebody, I know that's what it is. Okay. <sighs> Although not impossible, it is rare for a suspect to be so clear on the topic of the perpetrator, especially with so little time to process the death of his wife and youngest son. This detail could suggest that Alex had prepared and rehearsed this story previous to the murders. When did you get home? Right, um, right when you called or did you go to the house first? Where is the house? I came to the house first. My mom has late stages Alzheimer's and my dad is in the hospital. Okay. I left 
I don't know what time. I can go back on my phone and tell you the exact times. Did you check? Okay. Did I check what? Did you check them? The, the, we got medical guys that are, that, that's 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 what they're going to do, okay? Uh, what are they doing? Can they hurry? They are. Yes, sir. That, that gentleman that was out here already, he's one of the battalion chiefs, okay? How did you pull up you, from back there? I, came, I went to the house and they weren't home, which was odd. I tried to call. Okay. And then I knew they had been down here before I left to go to my mom's. Okay. And so uh, that is loaded. Okay. Um, you might want to unload it. But I mean, uh, is this the only firearm with you? Two of them, sir. This is the only one, or is there any more in the truck? I believe that's it. You think that's the only one? Okay. I'm 99%. Do you normally have right. any other firearms in your vehicle? I don't, but occasionally okay. there, occasionally there's a pistol in there. Okay. Just wait right here for me for a second, okay? They are dead, aren't they? Y yes, sir. That's what it, that's what it looks like. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> yeah, the police are here now. The police are here now. <sighs> That's my brother. Okay. When was the last time you were here with them? Or talked to them or anything like that? Um It was earlier tonight. Uh, I, I, I don't know the exact time, but okay. I left. I was probably gone an hour and a half from my mom's, and I saw them about 45 minutes before that. Okay. I rode around with Paul for two hours this afternoon in the, in the pickup truck. That's your son, Paul? Okay. Somebody going to check him? Yes, sir. They, they've already checked them. <laughs> they did check them? Yes, sir. It's official that they're dead? Yes, sir. That's what it looks like. <laughs> Mm. I'm sorry. No, no, you're fine. Mm. I'm very sorry. <clears throat> Gotta call her parents. What, what's what's her name? Her name is Maggie Murdoch. Margaret Brandstetter Murdoch. How you doing? What's her birthday? Um, 9-15-68. Okay, and what's your son's first name? You said Paul? Paul Terry Murdoch. And what's his birthday? Jason, um, do you have anybody coming through town that could stop and pick up that tent? I see lights and off in the distance. What are they, covering them up? I got some getting dressed now, Sheriff. I'll have somebody stop and grab it. You tell them they don't have to do that. They don't need to. Preserve what we can. Six five three. Where's it at? I'm in town. I should have tried to be Delta eight because he's gonna be the only one that's got access. What's Paul's to birthday? Right um. Um. April fourteenth. Um. 1999, sir. Put it up as wide as you can. <sighs> That's fine. You said 99? Sir? He was born in 99. He's born April 14th, 1999. Okay. What's your, what's your first name, sir? My name is Alex Richard Alexander Murdoch. <laughs> Richard Alexander Murdoch? Yeah, I'm sure he was. 
There's a couple of shell casings right there. Yeah, those will be easy to find. I was just marking a couple of it where in the gravel it might be harder to see at some point. Y'all familiar with this family? Yes. Uh, I wasn't until he told I me the names. Know the name. uh, Last name. Later. Murdoch. I don't. Anything else you need? I don't to think there's gonna be anything from any of you. What is that? Because I tell you. You said for Evo to do? Yeah. For yes. Evo. Okay, yeah. Hey, watch your step. Huh? There are. Yeah. Okay. Um, the gentleman in the white shirt is the husband of her, father of him. That is Paul Murdoch. That's just his mother. Paul Murdoch was that guy in the boating accident from a while back, if you remember. Yeah. Yeah. The murder family are known to the Colton County Police and the wider community for a number of reasons. The boat incident that the officers alluded to revolved around Alex's late son, Paul. On February 23, 2019, Paul crashed his boat carrying a group of his friends. He was highly intoxicated at the time. Witnesses also claim that Paul became very aggressive before the incident with him even going so far to slap his girlfriend. The boat crash resulted in heavy injuries to all involved, however young Mallory Beach paid the highest price. She was flung overboard and would be found dead five days later. The murder family would then be involved in a convoluted cover-up, including lies, bribes, and threats. Paul had also crashed a car earlier that year. Again, a cover-up ensued. Previous to the murders, Alex was also in legal trouble. He was facing 99 financial charges related to his own law firm, including embezzlement, money laundering, and tax evasion. The crimes do not stop there. The family are related to two other sudden deaths, including 19-year-old nursing student Stephen Smith and 57-year-old housekeeper Gloria Satterfield. Stephen Smith's body would be found on July 8, 2015, near the family estate. His death was initially put down to a hit and run. However, nearly a decade later, the case has been reopened, and a number of lines of inquiry are being investigated. This includes a potential relationship between Buster Murder and Stephen. Gloria Satterfield was the long-term housekeeper for the family. This was until February 8, 2018, when she would trip and fall down the stairs of Alex's $2 million home. She would pass away three days later. Unusually, her death would never be investigated by a coroner, and an autopsy would never be performed. Many in the local community believe Alex may have placed pressure on the authorities to take a less detailed look at the incident. What can't be understated is the power that this family holds within the state of South Carolina. They have had large ties to the legal system for three generations, vast wealth, and an extremely arrogant attitude, all amounting to a deadly cocktail. Most likely. He did have a firearm whenever I pulled up. It's a shotgun. It's been secured in my vehicle. You will have to give me just a few minutes, but yes, I will. Suspicions of Alex may be starting to form amongst the patrol officers present due to his persistence surrounding the perpetrators and the family's previous criminal history. His body language and verbal answers in the following interview would only grow these suspicions further, especially after cross-referencing his responses to the facts of the case. And sir, what was your name? Yeah, Danny Henderson. Okay. All right. Um, as I stated, I'm David Owen. And uh, Laura Rutland with Colleton County, and I'm with SLED. I hate to have to do this. I but, understand. Yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. So you don't, you don't, 
have any problem yeah. with it. So um, just start the top, take your time. Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see them and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. <laughs> my, my boy over there, I could see it was... I could see his brain on his... <laughs> and I ran over to Maggie and uh, actually I think I tried to turn Paul over first um uh you know, I tried to turn him over, and uh, I don't know. I figured it out. Um, uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try to do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife, and I, uh, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. mm, A large amount of Alex's verbal and physical communication over the last few moments has been consistent with a true victim, all up until this moment. Effects of grief and shock can vary from person to person. However, there are still common traits seen in every case. Victims who have just been through a horrific experience and are asked to recall details often stutter, struggle to form sentences, seldom make sense, and rarely go through their story in chronological order. This is because the effects of the grief and shock are overwhelming, making it difficult to concentrate on processing thoughts and verbally expressing them. In the next segment, Alex doesn't seem to suffer with these problems, despite it being so little time since he had discovered the bodies. This again suggests rehearsal. An example similar to this component of Alex's interview is that of Jennifer Pan. Jennifer is hoping to appear as a victim of a violent crime which took the life of her mother and severely injured her father. She was actually the mastermind behind the whole crime. Here you will see her demeanor change from emotional to calculated as she is asked to recall details, much like you witnessed Alex do just a few moments ago. My mom kept trying to get up, and they kept telling her to sit down. And so I didn't want her to get hurt, so I told her, Mom, sit down. They were trying to find her wallet, but she, her English sinker, so she kept saying first. They kept pushing her down onto the chair. Okay. Take your time. Take your time. All this is very important, so take your time. They kept all the lights off on the main floor. The only time there was light was when they opened the fridge door to see if they could find where my mom's purse was. I didn't at that point, I saw three figures of men. One with a hoodie, but the one I could see the most clearly, he had a hoodie on, and I believe he had a bandana of some sort covering from like his lower, uh, under his eyes down. And then, for some reason, I think one of the, the gentlemen asked my father if he had money in his wallet and where his wallet was. So they took me, because I was next to the stairwell, they took me up the stairs to sh show them where my father's wallet was. But I'm, I didn't know. They had turned the room upside down. I didn't know where his pants were at that time. And then, after they had gotten that, they had taken me and they tied me to the top of the banister. These details would not go unnoticed by the detectives. Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I called 911 um, pretty much right away. And... 
she was very good. Um, <clears throat> I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that. Um, and um, what family members did you call? Even? I called my brother Randy. And I called my brother John. And I tried to call a little boy, real good friend that's right around the corner from here, but I didn't get him. Okay. <clears throat> what all was around um, Paul when you walked up? Blood. Any any other anything else? I mean there was some body mm -hmm. things, yes sir. I mean like any other evidence. I know you said the phone fell out the pocket. Um, but did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? No, sir. Not, no, not the, no, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? A common trait seen in deceptive suspects is that they will often search for approval from their interrogator. Alex does this via eye contact. Almost every time he divulges a new piece of information, he glances at the detective for confirmation. What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to my mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover and okay. she fools with the dogs and I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. I left the house and went to my mom's <clears throat> for just a little while. Tried to call her when I left. <coughs> Texted her, no response. Um, when I got back to the house, the house was, obviously nobody was in there. So I figured they're still up here fooling around. Paul was um, gonna be getting set up to plant. Our sunflower seeds got sprayed and died and he was refiguring to do, to plant the sunflower seeds. Okay. So I came back up here and I drove up and saw and called. <coughs> Had Maggie and Paul been arguing over anything? No. What was their relationship like? Wonderful. Wonderful. How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, mm -hmm. wonderful relationship. And yours and Paul's relationship? As good as it could be. How old was Paul? 22. You know his date of birth? I do. April 11th, 96 is his brother's. April 14th, 99 is Paul's. And how about, what's Maggie's full name? Margaret Branstetter Murdoch. And her date of birth, sir? September 15th, 1968. y'all been having any problems out here trespassers none people that I, breaking in none that i know of the only thing that what comes to my mind is my son paul was in a boat wreck uh, a couple years ago mm -hmm. and there's been a you know he was charged with being uh, arrested for being the driver there's been a lot of negative publicity about that and there's been a lot of people online just really vile stuff, but when Paul's out and about, I mean, people routinely, I don't think I know the full story, um, so I don't think they give it to me, but I mean, he's been punched and hit and just attacked a lot, so, you know, but I mean, nothing like this. Yeah, any, any 
one person in particular or a group of people? I don't know. That you could think of? Not that I know, no, sir. Has he, other than being assaulted, has he received any direct threats related to the boat accident? Oh, yes. All the time he Re gets recently? Um, Yes, sir. I mean, he gets them all the time. Okay. He gets them all the time. <clears throat> what kind of, th I mean? I'm going to kick your ass, you know. I, I've never been privy firsthand, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Is that through social media? or No, ma'am. It's mostly like if, if he goes out places is what, you know, what he goes out like somewhere. He's in college, so if he goes out, is what I understand. Mm -hmm. I can find out better details from some of his younger friends on that. So is there anybody that you can think of that we need to talk to tonight? Is there a name that comes to mind? I mean, I can't tell you anybody that I'm overly suspicious of <coughs> off the top of my head. Okay. You know? Um, I mean, this is such a stupid thing. I'm even embarrassed to say it, but it just didn't make any sense. I just hired a guy out here, mm -hmm. and he really he wasn't cutting the mustard, but I hadn't told him this yet. Paul's been working with him a lot. He killed the sunflower seeds in our dove field just recently, which is why Paul was here doing this. He told Paul a story the other day about how when he was in high school, he got in a fight with some black guys. And the FBI undercover team observed him fighting those guys and put him on an undercover team with three Navy SEALs. And that their job was to kill radical black Panthers. And they did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. Now, I really don't think this guy, you know, mm -hmm. is probably the person, but that's just so friggin'. Yeah, that's kind of far-fetched story. It's weird, but he was off today. Okay. He took his daddy to the doctor. What's his name? C.B. Rowe. The amount of detail that Alex divulges on certain topics is interesting. On important matters like his alibi, he gives very little, however, on trivial topics like a blatant lie from a groundskeeper, he goes into heavy detail. The topics that he refuses to go into detail on are likely fabricated. R-O-W-E? Yeah, and I sent him a message to text me earlier today about sunflowers, and he called me back when I was on the way to my mom's house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you talk to him at that time? Briefly, I was on the phone with a lawyer friend of mine named Chris Wilson from Bamberg, so I told him I'd call him back okay. tomorrow, see him in the morning. When you briefly talked to um, Mr. Rowe, what was his demeanor or attitude? Or I mean, it seemed normal. I mean, I asked him about the sunflowers, and so, you know, I mean, I'm sure he's a little bit. Where does he live? I don't exactly know. Somewhere in Bluff, I mean in Bronson. Okay. When did, he, you, when did he tell that story to Paul? Uh, sometime last week. Okay. Sometime last week. Um, my son Paul actually... <sighs> And I really do not think, on all honesty, that it's him. But I know y'all got to check it out. But Paul was so taken aback by it <coughs> that he sent, I'll find it. I got it on my phone. He, he recorded him saying bits and pieces of it. Okay. No. But for all his weirdness, I, I mean, I do think they like 
I mean, they got along okay. pretty good. How long have they been working here? Uh, I guess about um, three or four pay periods, so um, eight weeks, a couple months. Okay. <clears throat> Going back to the boat incident, um, anybody on that boat really have a hard on for Paul that you would think would come after him or know of any direct threats from people on the boat? I don't know of any direct threats between any of the people on the boat okay. specifically, but I, I do think there's been a small amount of yip yap between a couple of them, but not recently. Okay. <clears throat> Most of this was stuff from people that Paul didn't really know. Okay. It was some people that he knew distantly, but more times than not, when I learned about it, it was somebody that he didn't know. Okay. Um, it's like, for example, he went out in Charleston a couple months ago, came back, you know, he got a black eye. And, you know, he can't defend himself right now because he has these charges. So, you know, he would, Paul was a real tough man's man. Mm -hmm. You know, he would just. He would defend himself, but he hadn't been. That's right. But how was he handling that case? <coughs> moving over everybody? As far as what? How was he handling it? I've never been prouder of him than the way he has handled the pressures and the adversity in that situation. I think I've told Danny that before. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful kid. He can do almost anything. He gets along with almost anybody. <clears throat> do y'all store any weapons out here? Um, we don't store them, but they're, you know, they're frequently out here. Mm -hmm. I need to find out if there were any out here because I know there was a shotgun. There was a 12-gauge shotgun out here. Uh, <coughs> I'll have to find out exactly when that was think it got put up, but I'm not positive. What did that shotgun look like? Uh, it was a camouflage. Uh, I, I want to say it was a Benelli or maybe a Beretta. I can't remember which brand it is. But I don't think it was out here. Okay recently but I'm not positive and the, the shotgun that you had when deputies pulled up where did that come, come from I went to the house and I got a gun probably overreacting but and it was that when you pulled up and saw them was, no I, I mean I came out and I mean I called 911 first mm -hmm. talked to them for a little while and then I told her told her that I was that I was going to go to the house okay and that I would let authorities know when they got here that I had a gun okay do you happen to have a list of all your guns I can make one I don't okay. have one yeah. but I can make one okay well I'm just saying you know so we could compare if that shotgun was out here and now it's missing absolutely um try to figure figure that out I know, absolutely. And I know living out here in the country, you probably have more than one or two. We do. We probably have 20, 25 guns, yeah. Shotguns, rifles, rifles, pistols. Any rifles? Yes, sir. And what kind of rifles? All kinds. Yeah. Two weapons were used in the slayings, a shotgun and a three hundred blackout rifle. Firearms of all kinds were commonly used in the murder household. So as a precaution, the police took an inventory and seized all of the weapons. The murder weapons were not found in the search. However, conveniently, a 300 blackout rifle owned by Paul and a range of shotguns were missing and not reported stolen. Despite the missing weapons, one piece of evidence would cast even further doubt. After a review of the crime scene, um, 
where were those ident where were those located? Um, after reviewing the crime scene diagram, it's my understanding that those uh, cartridge cases um, were at marker numbers that were uh, near or around um, the body of Margaret Murdoch. And those would be 300 blackout rounds, is that right? That's correct. That, they're 300 blackout caliber. Or they were spent casings? Yes, sir. Those are uh, fired cartridge cases. And states uh, exhibit 260, items 35 through 39. What are those again? Um, those were um, all fired 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases, um, head stamped with the SMB logo with the, and 300 blackout caliber. And where were those items recovered? Um, listed on our submission documents, um, those were from the ground at side entrance door. Have you physically been there to the Moselle property? Uh, yes, sir, I have. Are you familiar with this, the ground at the side entrance door? Yes, sir, I believe so. Is that the side entrance that leads into the pool table and the gun room? Uh, based on my understanding of, of the scene, yes, sir. Um, I believe that is where those were collected from near that door that goes into that room. We have, we have 300 blackout round casings from collected from around Maggie's body and we have 300 casings collected from the house. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Greer, tell us what you found concerning those items. Um, based on my examination, um, it was determined that um, items two through seven, um, 35 through 37 and 39 um, had matching mechanism marks and it was concluded that those items had been loaded into, extracted and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time. So if I understand it correctly, the items collected right by Maggie had been extracted, to, loaded into, extracted to and ejected by the same firearm that were identified that items were picked up by the side of the house. Yes, sir, that is correct. Okay. I mean, you name it across the board, we have them. Okay. And I mean, they're all of them we have are, you know, in a hunting room in our house. What was their schedule today? When did they get home? My son works for my brother, and he was coming home to deal with the sunflowers. Um, uh, he got here, uh, he got here pretty early because he and I rode around looking at everything for a good little while, probably 45 minutes to an hour. Um, Maggie had things she did in Charleston and, um, she had a doctor's appointment in Charleston and she got back here. It was fairly late. Was it dark yet when Paul got home? No, Paul got home early. Early, okay. So before dinner time? Before oh, yes, ma'am. Lunch time? Or? No, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> um, what doctor's appointment? What doctor did Maggie see today? Um, I forget the guy's name. Maggie's been having trouble with her She's been having trouble with her stomach and her tooth. I'm not positive. It was sort of a routine visit, and I can't remember. She told me the name of him, and I can't. I want to say Gordon. Gordine, Gordon. Okay. Is um, who I think she saw. So was she back home around supper time? Or... Um, or six o'clock, seven o'clock. I don't think she got back quite that early. I think she got back a little bit later than that. Okay. Um, what did you do today? Were you at the office or? No, nope, I was home. I came home. Paul and I messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house. I laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up, I called Maggie, didn't get an answer. And I left to go to my mom's. 
She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't when I go over there. Um, and I think I texted her. And she's very good about answering the phone, so that was odd, or calling me back. Mm -hmm. So that was odd, but it wasn't that big a deal. Now, what time was that? What, what time was what? That you sent her a text message. I checked, texted her at 9.08, going to check on M, be right back. And then I texted her at 9.47. That must be when I started to come back. I think I called her before that. But let me make sure. Uh, pretty sure that I called her 9.45. And then I tried Paul. And then, no, I think that was riding. I think that might have been riding over there. Ten o three. I mean, my calls are right here. Yeah. So, um, obviously, this is when. This is when I, at 10.06. The lack of urgency seen in Alex's actions is alarming. A true victim wouldn't be as casual and calm as Alex is in this moment. Also, it wouldn't be uncommon to see at least a semblance of anger in this scenario. Yes, sir. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Take Anybody else want some gum? No, you don't have any water, do you, Danny? Sure. I'm sorry. I don't need it. <clears throat> if you, behind Danny's head, is a oh. case of water. It's not a big deal. Yeah, I got some right here. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. sure we're going to have much more questions. I'm available at, you know, you let me know. <clears throat> All right. Um, I can't think of anything else right now, but, you know, we'll certainly be in touch. Um, Thank y'all for everything y'all are doing. Yes, sir. For the next three days, the detectives would continue to investigate the evening's events. During that period, fingerprints, DNA, tire tracks, and all other forms of evidence would suggest that there was no intruder that night. This led them to suspect Alex even further. Therefore, they would invite him for a second informal interview to clarify details and lock him into a story which could then be analyzed after the meeting. <clears throat> all right, sir. Um, so when we spoke the other night, I got kind of a basic overview yes sir um and it was pretty traumatic that's okay um, yeah. I, I know so, you yeah. need to ask me you ask me what you need to so i just I, I want you to let's start monday morning and and take me through your day monday morning uh you know did i do monday morning um my wife and my older son had gone to the baseball games that weekend mm -hmm. um You know, I, I really can't remember what I did Monday. I know I went to work, okay. but you know, I think I was dragging a little bit from the weekend, mm -hmm. and but I went to work. Um, I usually mess around on my farm, and then I go to work, 
um, I was at work. Okay. Um, you know. Were you at the office in Hampton? Or? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So I was at my office in Hampton. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I was just at my office doing. Legal work? Yes, sir. I'm sure I can go back and probably recreate some specifics mm -hmm. if you need me to, but I can't like sit here and recall on the top of my head exactly mm -hmm. what I was working on. I know one thing I was working on um, was we had some we had some big motions coming up in a um, Dominion Energy case. I was getting ready for those, and uh, I was getting ready for some motions. I'm a defendant in a civil case involving my son. I told you about mm -hmm. the boat wreck. Yep. Not only did Paul cause the death of Mallory Beach the day of the boat crash, he and his family also conducted themselves terribly after the event. Paul lied to the police and claimed he wasn't driving the boat, placing all of the blame on Mallory's boyfriend. Alex tried to gaslight Mallory's boyfriend into taking the fall and then nonchalantly told the victim's mother that her daughter would no doubt be dead. This was on day three of a five-day search. Finally, Maggie appeared to laugh at the mention of Mallory's name during the search for her body. As a result of these actions, this line of inquiry had to be thoroughly investigated due to the amount of enemies the family made. However, no serious suspects were ever found. Yes, and there were some motions coming up in that on Thursday, and I was mostly just getting ready for those things, and okay. then other junk. Uh, what time did you leave the house to go to the office? I'm not sure. Uh, who, who all was at the house when you left? To go to my office yes. that morning mm -hmm. or when you got up who was at the house i'm sure my wife was um and i can't remember if blanca had made it out there yet or not and who was blanca blanca is our housekeeper okay okay and she comes mm -hmm. different she doesn't have set hours but she comes most days um she'll be able to tell you if i yeah. was there when when i when she left or not okay. I, I just i can't remember and so you, you went to the office, you did, you know, some motions. Uh, what time did you leave the office? I left a little bit earlier than normal because my son Paul was coming home. Okay. Because um, he had not been with us that, during the weekend. And he was coming home. We were going to, um, we were going to replant some sunflowers the next day. Okay. And so he was calibrating, doing and getting everything ready. Um, so he got home a little early. I left a little early, so he and I could knock around, and we knocked around for, you know, just doing things we like to do out there. Okay. You know, we're riding around looking at um, um, food plots, looking, you know, look looking for hogs, a little bit of target shooting, just bullshit. Yeah. You said Paul wasn't with you over the weekend. Where does he does he live with you at the house on Moselle? Well, I mean that's his home, but yeah. he has an apartment in Columbia. Okay. Um, and he goes to Charleston a lot of weekends with his buddies. Okay. And and he had been in Charleston for the weekend. Okay. And then Paul works for my brother John. This mm -hmm. is out here, you met John. Yes, sir. So Paul works for him. So Paul. Uh, decided to go to he went to spend the night with my brother his uncle John they were very very close okay. um, Sunday night okay. and then he worked for John Marvin and he came home Monday afternoon okay about roughly what time in the afternoon you know, I would think it'd be somewhere in the five o'clock range, a little bit. It was it was broad daylight when we were. It wasn't dusk, dark, or late. Okay. You know, and we rode. Uh, you know, we just rode around. We rode mm -hmm. around our dove field, looking at how the corn was doing. He, he had, um, he and I had planted corn in the dove field, and he planted the corn in the duck pond, and he was, you know, showing me how much better his corn was doing than mine was. <laughs> And um, we rode around the duck pond. I mean, we just, you know, we rode the property. Yes, sir. You know, we just, we rode the property. Um, then, you know, I mean, we, we rode around so much. Um, we just rode. Okay. Uh, probably. Uh, 
we, it was a yeah. good little while. It was yeah. more than 20 minutes yeah. or 30 minutes. Okay. And, you know, was it two hours? I don't know. I'd say it was more than an hour, probably. A common theme throughout all of Alex's dealings with the police is his deliberate vagueness when explaining his timeline. He likely does this to avoid being tied down to a specific story that could be ripped apart upon examination. Really wasn't keeping track of time. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't getting dark. Mama wasn't home yet. She had gone to a doctor's appointment. Um, so, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> just out of curiosity, target practice, what y'all shooting? Uh, just a little bottle. You, you mean what gun? Yeah. A twenty-two okay. Magnum. Rat shot. I think no, it wasn't yeah. rat shot. I think he shot. I think he shot two times, and I shot one time. Okay. So after y'all got finished riding around, try to take me through the rest of the evening. All right. Um, you know, at some point we were all back at the house together. Mm -hmm. um, Maggie had gotten home, and. You know, we sat down, we ate supper, in which we usually eat supper together. Um, so, um, the one thing I remember, I don't know how much detail y'all want, so if I start talking about something that you don't need, just tell me and I'll move to something else. The, the more detail, the better, sir. So, Paul has been having um, high blood pressure mm -hmm. and his mama was worried sick about it. So, we were actually, you know, this was, a direct thing getting him he doesn't like to go to doctors making him go get his blood pressure checked his feet had swollen up recently wow. so you know that was it, it was, a, it was a, a big huge deal okay uh, you know we hung around the house for a little while uh, I know that Maggie went to the kennels um, I don't know exactly where Paul went but he left the house too okay how did Maggie get down to the kennels I don't know exactly, but on normal occasions, she would drive, drive a buggy, drive a four-wheeler, or very common for her to walk. Okay. How about Paul? What's... Paul wasn't much of a walker, but he would use all of the others. Okay. Um, but, it, it, I mean, it could be anyway, okay. you know? I, I don't know exactly. <clears throat> I wish I could help you with that. So, so they left and went down to the kennels. Well, Maggie went to go to the kennels. Okay, and Paul and Paul left. And I'm assuming, you know, I'm assuming Paul left okay. because of, you know, gotcha. what happened. I mean, I'm assuming Paul yeah, yeah. went to the kennels. Okay. Um, and what did you do once once Maggie and Paul left? I stayed in the house. Okay. And I was watching TV looking at my phone, and I actually fell asleep on the couch. Okay. And what time did you wake You know, I don't know ex up? exactly what time I woke up, but when y'all get my phone, you know, I think one of the first things I did when I got up was call Maggie mm -hmm. because I was going to my mom's. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I texted her because I checked my phone. And what time did we say the text was, Jim? Like 9.06? I, I didn't see it. Yeah, I, I got it written down from the other I night. I showed you the other yes, night, yes, didn't I? Yes, sir, I got this. So, you know, I texted her. So I called her just before that. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, she she didn't answer at that point. Um, and I left to go to my mom's. Okay. Car parking data shows Alex left to visit his mother at 9.06 p.m. and returned an hour later. He claimed he visited for 40 minutes. However, all is not how it seems. At some point on the evening of June 7th of 2021, did you see Alex Murdoch? Yes. Okay. Do you remember what time it was? Um, Approximately. The game show was on, so it had to have been um, 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9.30, somewhere up in there. 8.30, 9, 9.30? Yeah, somewhere up in there. Okay. Is it fair to say it was later in the evening? It was late in the evening, yes. Okay. And you had worked that schedule for that 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. shift for how long? Two years. Two years? Mm -hmm. Two years. Was it unusual to see Alex Murdoch at that residence that time of night? Yes, on my shift, yes. And that's the only shift you'd work? Yes. 
So the 8 p.m. to the 8 a.m. shift, it was unusual to see Alex Murdoch there visiting, correct? Correct, yes. Had you ever been over there before that time of night? I think different off and on, it dep all depends. When he got there, can you tell the jury um, what happened? He called the house and told me he was outside. He called the house? Mm -hmm. Yes. What, what phone did he call? Um, it's a terrible question. I mean, was it your phone, the house phone? The house I'm not phone. The house phone. Okay. And when you answered the house phone, uh, what did he say? He was outside. He let him in. He was at the house? Yes. Right outside the house? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he called you? Yes. And he said, let me in? Mm -hmm. Yes. And after he called you, um, how long did it take you to go open the door to let him in? About five, about five minutes. So he was right there mm -hmm. at the house? Yes. You let him in? Of course, yes. Um, could you describe Alex Murdoch's demeanor on June 7th when you were there with him and his mother Libby? He How was he acting? Like, fidgety, this came in, you know. S speak up, please. Fidgety, man. like fidgety, I'm thinking it's normal. What did you say then? Like he was fidgety, like, fidgety. yeah. Fidgety? Yes. So okay. How long did he stay there? Just past minutes. I forgot. 20 minutes, about 20 minutes. Twenty minutes? Mm -hmm, about twenty minutes. Okay. What happened after that? He left. And do you remember the day of uh, Mr. Uh, I'm going to call him Slister's way I know him. Slister funeral. Yes. And during this um, repast, visitation, where were you? What, and I said, what was your job during that? Or what were you doing during the visitation? I was in the room with Miss Libby. It was back and forth. And, and, and sometime that afternoon, did you see Alex Murdoch? Yes. Okay. Tell the jury about that, please. He came in the room, you know. It's, can you speak up, please, man? He came in the room and speak that, you know, spoke like he always do. Okay. And, and what did he tell you? That he was sitting at the house. He was at the house. Say it again? He was at the house. And I'm not 100% following you. He was telling you or saying to you that he was at the house? Mm -hmm. When? Um, the night of the murders. The, the night, night, of night of the murders? Yes. What was he telling you about that he was at the house the night of the murders? That he'd been there 30 to 40 minutes. Was he telling you that? Did he ask you anything about that when he was talking to you? <laughs> Yes. Did he indicate to you what he wanted you to do with that information? No. Mm -mm. No. no. What did he say? He just said that he was at the house for 30 or 40 minutes. I said. You said what? Was he there 30 or 40 minutes that night? Not to my recall. Why are you crying, Miss Nick? Because it's a good fam, a good family, and I love working here. And I'm sorry all this happened. It good people, you know. But he wasn't there no thirty or forty minutes, was he? No, no. Can't leave the witness. Did that did that conversation upset you? <clears throat> Somewhat. You upset right now? Yes. Did you call anybody about it? My brother. You called your brother after that conversation with Alan? Yes. To tell him about that conversation? Yes.
And just to be clear, what was the statement he said about how long he was here? 30 to 40 minutes. But, but his phrase was, I was here or you know I was, I was here? I was here 30 to 40 minutes. Not the prize, but I can't help it sometimes. What else was going on in your life right there? This, um, just working. Hours and hours. Yeah, you're really, you're whispering. I can't understand what you're saying. Were you going to get married? I was, I was planning on getting married. I was planning on to. And, and had Alex Murdoch mentioned anything to you about your upcoming nuptials? Yes. And, and when was that? The day after was, I'm thinking. The day after this? I'm thinking it was, after yes. After the conversation yes. you said? Where were you? At Miss Levy, at the house. And uh, what did he say about your marriage, your upcoming potential marriage? I heard you was getting married. I said, yes. He said, if I could, um, you just let me know because I know wedding's going to be expensive. I said, well, thank you. The wedding's going to be expensive? He said, wedding's going to be expensive. That's said, well, thank you. Did he offer to help? Yes, he offered. He offered. That's the type of person, a good person. And did he ever mention the wedding to you before? No. Mm -mm. Did you mention that to him before? No. Uh -uh. Hey, did he th have a conversation, any, anything else about your job? Were you working at the school? Yes, at the school, yes. Did Mr. Murdoch mention to you about your school and your position there? Yes. Tell him what he said, please. He said that, um, you know, if you need a position at school, you know, my good friend is there. I said, yeah, I know, worked at the school, the principal. Okay. Y'all just have to look. I, I don't. Yeah. I'm not sure if I called Paul. Well, or not. And, and that and that's why we're getting the phone so we can nail down the times and right. and, and everything. Um, so I left. I drove. Uh, well, you know, I'm gonna tell y'all this, even though I think it's kind of crazy. You know, I was certain that I heard them pull up. I mean, I was positive that I heard. And and people don't just come out there. You yeah. know, we don't get like pass through. I was certain that I heard them pull up, but I, but they didn't. Okay. Um, well, if you, if you heard something pull up, what did it sound like? You know, I, I, I don't, I can't tell you what it sounded like. I just know that I thought they, I thought that, that my wife had pulled up or I mean, that Paul it, had pulled up. Would it, would it have been the buggy that she normally drives or would it be a car? No, no, I, I, I had the impression that a, that a, a car pulled up, Okay. you know? And, and had you woken up by that time, but hadn't left for your mom's? Yep. Okay. And, and, but it wasn't much time in between there because mm -hmm. I left pretty damn close. It wasn't much time between me waking up and me leaving the house. Okay. I left, I drove to, I drove to my mom's. Um, I and checked she, on and my mom. she lives mom. right out here, she correct? Li she lives at Alameda. Okay. Checked on my mom, talked with Shelly for a few minutes. You know, um, so Shelly is the caregiver. Okay. <laughs> and um, you know, I know that I called some people on the way. That I know I returned a call from my brother John. Um, I know that I called Chris Wilson. Um, I know that I talked to Buster. Um. So I made a few phone calls. Okay. And so where are we? Right, you, so you, then I you left, left your mom's, mom's and making phone calls. I left my mom's and I, I went back home. I got to the house. Uh, I went inside. Nobody was there. I got in the car. I went back to the kennels and, you know. And you, when you went back to the kennels besides Maggie and Paul, did you see anybody, any cars? I didn't see take, anything take right then, no, sir. Take your time. You know, I saw Maggie and I saw Paul laying down. I knew, you know, I didn't know, you know, I, I knew it was bad. I went over there and, you know, I saw it. Yeah. And, you know, I called 911. Okay. Car parking data on Alex's Chevrolet Suburban and phone records corroborate this statement, too.
The data proves Alex returned to the kennels at 10.06 p.m., only 20 seconds before the call to the police. The prosecution would argue that this is not enough time to find the bodies, establish that they had been shot, check their pulses, and make the call. And, you know, what what made you decide to go back to the house and get a gun? Yeah, I, I, I just think the whole scene had me freaked out. Okay. Did you you take your car back up there, or did you run up there? No, I drove. Okay. And of course, the shotgun that we have is the one you brought back. They were asking me earlier. I'm not sure which one it was. <clears throat> Jim, it was a 12 gauge. I know, 12, um, okay. Yeah, Ronnie had a question if it was 12 or 20, it was a 12 right. gauge. And it was that camo, though, right? Yes, sir. I think it was the uh, 12 um, camo Benelli. 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 I think so. <clears throat> but that's about all you got, Benelli, out there, right? And, and we talked about this a little bit the other night, too. I, I know Paul had been getting some threats and getting some some being and being assaulted from you know the boat who who stands out in your mind beside, besides the boat incident who stands out in your mind that would want to come after after paul and or maggie i mean sir i can't think of anybody who would want to go to that extreme so, being a dad myself, what was the biggest issue you had with Paul when you had when you had to call him down and, and scold him or correct him? What was the biggest issue you had with Paul? You know, uh, I mean, I, irresponsibility. You know, um, he was ADHD. He was bad about jumping from, and he had so many wonderful qualities now. Mm -hmm. But he was bad about jumping from. He'd start this, maybe not quite finish it, move, do something else. And, you know, you'll find out from his friends, he had clothes strung out all over the state. He did that with clothes. He did that with guns. He did that with my boats. He lost. So. He lost what? He, he would misplace stuff or just okay. you know, leave stuff behind, right? Yes, everywhere, everywhere. I mean. He would go off for the weekend. Sometimes he wouldn't pack clothes because he's got clothes in somebody's house. I mean, Paul. Paul was one. He, like, he he wouldn't understand how you go out. You know, you and one you and a girl go out on a date. He 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 liked the crowd. How is your relationship with Maggie? Very good. As good as it could possibly be. I mean, you know, we yeah. had our issues, but wonderful. And I'm just trying to understand the family dynamic. I understand you got to do what yeah. you got to do. I promise. What was y'all's biggest arguments? Would would what your biggest ar the things that y'all would argue about the most? What would they be over? I mean, we really didn't argue, but the basic I'd say the really the only thing that caused any friction between us is she was always wanting us to go and I love her in-laws I mean they're wonderful people I love them to death she was always wanting to go there stay there a little longer than me and the boys wanted to stay that was really and, and it really you know she'd get really she'd get ticked off yeah you mean her family you said yeah. her in-laws you mean her family I mean her yeah. family You're I mean, we really didn't argue about much. We didn't have much to argue about. I mean, I'm sure there was an occasional thing that came up that we argued about, but mm -hmm. I can't tell you what it is. I can't think of it. Alex talks many times throughout his multiple interviews about how strong his relationship was with his wife. This couldn't be further from the truth. A source close to the couple claims the pair would constantly argue over financial issues, rarely spend quality time together, and suggests that towards the end of her life, Maggie visited a divorce lawyer and began to squirrel money away. Those surrounding the case believe Alex's marital and financial issues, the potential lawsuit to arise from the boat incident, and Alex's narcissistic tendencies to be the main reasons for the killings. 
make sure she took care of me and the boys and I mean she did everything <clears throat> she did absolutely everything <clears throat> I'm sorry no no you have every right to do it <clears throat> I'm good you go ahead have you talked to um, CB row since Monday or Tuesday Yes, sir. Because I know we, we talked about what he had done on the farm. Have y'all, is he still employed? He's still employed because I got to have somebody keeping it clean. But I, I mean, I, I can't keep him. Mm. I mean, he's an idiot. Yeah. And, you know, I know I told you, I don't know why that story seemed important to me the other night. Yeah. Well, I it, really can't see CB Rowe doing, I, I just can't. I, I really do not believe that. Well, it, I mean, it, it's an odd story. It's um, a messed up story. And, you know, and, and I just... Being in law enforcement for so long and and working these type cases, and I don't know the Islington era, area, but talking to Collin and County and seeing the property and how isolated it is, Finding somebody that's just going to randomly come up there that late at night that doesn't know the property, you know, that's, so I, of course I have to look within and then start working my way out. So you feel like it's not random? You feel like it's intentional? I mean, planned? I, I don't know what to feel right now. I mean, certainly... You know, talking about the investigation, certainly we're, we're looking at every angle, trying to figure out what fits. Um, and we're, talk, we're talking to, you know, people that were involved in the boat case. We're talk, trying to track down people that Paul knew and were friends with. That's why I asked who he was in Charleston with. So we can go try and see if they might know something or try to figure something out. Um, we're trying to get into his phone um, to see if there's any information, see if he got like a direct threat from somebody there. Um, I mean, the people that are here are not the only ones working on this. Uh, we've got people out doing things right now. Thank you. Um, I mean, we're just, we're trying to pull everything in. Um, just the area, Islington, unfortunately, they don't, there's not a lot of people moving around. Um, I mean, I've got, got somebody looking at videos right now back at the office, coming through hours of videos that we've gone out and collected. Well, thank you all. Yeah. Very much. So. Mr. Alec. I'm, you don't have to call me, miss. You just I'm, call I'm me sorry. Alec. Thank you for that courtesy. <clears throat> when y'all, well, when you and Paul got back to the house, Miss Maggie's there, and y'all eat supper, which has been prepared, and you, say, you said you laid down and, and took a little nap, and when you got up, Maggie and Paul was gone, or did they leave when you laid down? Or before I, you laid down? I, I believe that. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. But they weren't there when you woke up around the nine o'clock mark or so when when you made the call to Maggie to to let her know you was going to your. No, office. nobody was in that house when I when I left. <laughs> and just trying to narrow that the, the last time that Paul and you saw Paul and Maggie's when y'all were eating supper 
Yes, sir. Up until you came back from your mom's and, yes, and found what you found. You got a, a, yes, a, Alex probably told you all this. <laughs> he did check for a pulse. Yes. And, that, and that's why we want to do the DNA. Right. Uh, to to uh, inspect the DNA. You know. uh, right. Oh my God. Right. Oh my God. Right. I don't want to be the guy. Don't know. Yes. When you... When you tried to turn Paul over, do you know if you tried to turn him like towards the kennels or away from the kennels? Uh, and his phone fell out. Away, I think I turned him away. Okay. When the when when Paul's phone came out, did you you just pick it up and put it on you know place it back down on him or? You know, yeah, I did not try to open it or anything. You know, I just I don't know how I had in my mind that I needed to not mess anything up. I had that I had that. You know, somehow I had that presence of mind that I needed to not mess anything up. And so, I tried not to. And, and you definitely saw a traumatic picture and, and I know it's not hard. <laughs> Are not not easy. I know it's hard. Um, and sitting here talking today is is tough. It's just so bad. I did it so bad. It is rare for a suspect to go from calm to extremely emotional with little buildup in between. Also, the fact that Alex turns his whole body away when he begins to cry may suggest his emotions are fabricated. Importantly. This is not the biggest red flag in this segment. There is large discussion over whether Alex says, they did him so bad, or I did him so bad. I'm gonna play the clip from State's Exhibit 243, which is in evidence. I want you to listen again with the jury. Hang, hang on, y'all. All right, let's, let's play it. Please, Doug. Exhibit uh, 243 in evidence. It's, it's tough. <laughs> it's just so bad. I did it so bad. All right. Back it up and play it in real time again, Doug. Real time. <laughs> or not, not easy. I know it's hard. Um, <laughs> Sitting here talking today is, is tough. It's just so bad. I did it so bad. <laughs> did you hear now, they or I? I will still testify that my hearing, I hear I. Okay. Your Honor, we'd like to play it again at one third speed to slow it down. It's just the same. Thank you. Speed when the foundation laid for who's manipulating it, how it's being manipulated. Uh, I think uh, obviously we have it in real time, but there would have to be some additional foundation. Right, please play it one third speed.
hear they then? No, sir, I did not. Okay. But you would agree the jury gets to decide what he what he said on that tape. That's the best evidence. The I agree audience. that they get to hear the tape and make their own mind up as to what he said, yes, sir. Thank you, that's all I have on that. It's tough. <laughs> It's just so bad. I did it so bad. <laughs> He's such a good boy, too. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Go ahead. <clears throat> and but you know the little the little things that we've got. I understand. Is is necessary so that we can. We can get a little better picture as to, to you know, to what may have happened. <clears throat> well, I just thank y'all for everything. The police continued to investigate this crime thoroughly. However, again, no leads would pan out. As a result, the spotlight would be placed on Alex. Um, Alex, I, I appreciate you coming in today. Um, yes, good evening. I understand. Um, I know we got a lot to talk about. You, know, you have man's questions. But before we get started with your questions, this has been going on for over two months, and we've done a lot of work. I know you have. And I've got some more questions that I need to get clarifications on. Sure. Okay. Um, so we'll just we'll start with that. Wait a minute. Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Um, maybe I'm maybe I'm mistaken. Mm -hmm. I thought I thought we were coming here so you can update him on what's going on. And I intend to do that as okay, we, let's, as right, we let's do that first. Okay. Right, let's well, do that first. The update is I'm doing the investigation. And I have some questions that I need, I would like some answers to. And I mean, certainly if, if you know, I ask the question, if you don't want to answer it, you don't have to answer it. No, I'm fine with that. Though. I mean, if it's, it's more clarifications of the two interviews you've already given me. I totally understand. Okay. Just wait one second. Yeah. Wait one second. All right. Um, I need for you to tell me, are you going to give us information or are we just here for you to ask questions? No, I'm going to give you some information. Right. Why can't you give us information first? Some of the information that you're asking about are in my questions. And as we go through, you'll see. Okay. I don't mind. I don't mind. I know you don't. I know you don't. Know, but I can't. I mean, I'm a friend, but I'm also a lawyer, and I, I like to know what, what we're doing. I like to understand what we're talking about. You know, um, well, well, I, need you to, I need you to answer this question. Are you asking him questions to further your investigation, or are you asking him questions because you think that he's a suspect? I need a straight answer. I am asking these questions to further my investigation. All right. What, does that mean that you're not asking him these questions as a suspect? Because it. Good. Say. Because I'm not comfortable with you asking him questions as a suspect when when. I came here with the thought that you were going to be telling him where you are in the investigation, what it is, what it is you've done, seen, uncovered, whatever. That's why we came here. Well, let, let me let me respond to your question. Yeah. Um, it may not be a direct answer that you're looking for, mm -hmm. um, and I've and I've told Alec this when, when we first met. Any homicide investigation, mm -hmm. you start with the closest person and or the person who found the deceased. Mm -hmm. Both cases, that's Alec. Mm -hmm. Everybody stays in that investigation until we can get them out. Mm -hmm. And right now, because of the questions that I have that I need explanations for, I cannot get Alec out. Okay. Right. That's a reasonable statement. I don't have any problem with that statement. That's fine. Um, I don't read it, but um, everybody in the United States of America has an opinion on this case. Mm -hmm. And 
because I know everybody, I know it's a bunch of bullshit. Um, I can't imagine that y'all are going to be asking about nonsense in the, in the internet. No. No. Well, I mean, just, just like you, I'm aware of what's out there. Yeah. I have not read every article. I don't care to read every article because they're not doing the investigation. That's right. I am. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, uh, you know, Ellie, if you're comfortable and you feel I'm, okay, yes. then that's fine. Do anything to help. All right. That's fine. So I'm going to go back to Monday morning. And you went to the office. Okay. What time did you go to the office? Who, who is who was at your house when you left? And what time did you go to the office? Uh, uh, we had been to a ball game that weekend. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what time it would have been. Uh, somewhere between eight thirty and nine thirty, probably okay. ten o'clock, maybe okay. at the latest. Okay. Something like that. And, and, and when I ask about time, I'm not saying you know, it was 5 11 or something like that. I just totally understand. I need the ballpark. That's as close as you can get to it. And if, if you need to know exactly when, um, my. There, there, there would be a keypad that would tell when, when exactly I went in my office. Okay. That I can get for you. Okay. So. Y'all, so you have a key fob to get in your office? A, a card. A card. Yes, card. Sir. Okay. Gotcha. But, you know, a little bit, you know, it's probably a little bit on the later side of that. If I, I guess I know Maggie got up early um, to get out of there because she had an appointment in Charleston. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't remember if I left right after she did or I piddled around. But in our Alex is currently rocking back and forth in his chair, likely in an attempt to soothe severe anxiety and stress. The amount of stress he is clearly under is interesting, as at this point in time, the questions he has been asked have been rather tame. I already know that Paul stayed at John Mormons at night, so it was just you and Magda in the house. That's correct. Okay. Um, and I know when, we, when you were at the office, you were working on motions, and some of those motions you dealt with were for Paul's, the, the boat, boat accident, or the boat case. I don't really, I'm not really doing the legal work. I understand, I understand, but, uh, you know, you're Paul's dad, you're a lawyer, you're definitely going to know what's going on. Yeah. Um, I mean, so what were those motions? I mean, did it deal with Parker's, or was it the actual boat accident, or? It was the civil, it was the civil case. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> what time did you leave and get home? Earlier than normal. Um, I'd say 5.30. That's when you left the office? Yes, sir. Okay. What time did Paul get home that night? Um, me and Paul, Got there about the same time. Maybe he was a little bit later than me, or maybe a little bit earlier than me, but it was close to the same time. Okay. And y'all rode around the farm. Um, I believe you said two different trucks or two different vehicles. So, what were those two different vehicles? Oh, we rode in the in the white pickup truck, and we rode in the black pickup truck. And either one of those, did, did you see any long guns? Any, take, take your time. It's okay. Did you see any rifles or shotguns? Um, I don't remember seeing any that day, no. We did have <coughs> pistols. Yeah, because I know you said you went to target practice. Well, not really target practice, okay, just, just shoot. Yeah. We rode around for a couple of hours, just looked at everything. All the stuff Paul did on the farm. And, um, we just spent, you know, time, time ago. 
that was the first thing we looked at. And then we just rode. We just rode and looked at. I mean, we hadn't done it in a while. We just rode, talked, <laughs> and rode, talked. What you talk about? Everything, you know. Just <clears throat> one of the main things, he'd been having trouble, his feet had swelled up, and we were worried about blood pressure and stress on him. And, I mean, he handled all this stuff so amazingly, but, I mean, we were just so worried about it. <laughs> But, I mean, we talked about that. We talked about the farm. We just talked about everything. One detail to notice is the detectives' responses to Alex's outbursts. Their reactions to his emotions appear less sympathetic than previous times, and they don't allow him the opportunity to cry his way out of difficult situations. What time did Maggie get back home that night? Later. Um... I'd say probably, the best I can tell, a couple hours after um, after us, after we got there. When y'all returned, when you and Paul returned back to the house, was Maggie there? I can't remember if Maggie came by the, the um, shed when Paul and I were up there, or if we met her at the house. But, you know, <clears throat> it's not unusual for her if we're messing around for her to swing through up there. Mm -hmm. And Maggie was supposed to be coming home. I've since found out she was worried about me and me worried about my dad. Mm -hmm. And so she came home. Where was she going to stay that night? At Edisto. We were having work done down there. And I wasn't 100%, but it's pretty well she was going to stay at Edisto. So I'm kind of surprised you that she came back? Uh, no, it didn't totally surprise me. She had let me know earlier that she was coming home. But then I found out later why she came home. She was concerned for you? Sir. What time did y'all sit down and eat dinner? Not too long after that. Blanc had made dinner. <clears throat> and so the three of us ate dinner together. What was the conversation around the dinner table? Normal. Regular stuff. I mean, I can't tell you exactly, but... And after dinner, Maggie and Paul... <laughs> Went to the kennels, or you know, I don't know exactly how that went. Um, I stayed on the couch and I dozed off. Okay. So. And then I got up. There is a video on Paul's phone of um, you and him on the farm that night. And you were in khaki pants and a dress shirt. You were playing with a tree. I don't remember playing with a tree. Yeah. I guess there was a tree sapling or something that was had fallen over or bending over and you were trying to get it to stand back. This is the video in question. <laughs> stand up. Uh, but I mean, the, the question in that is. When I met you that night, you were in shorts and a t-shirt. At what point in that evening did you change clothes? I'm not sure. I, you know, it would have been... Before dinner or after dinner? No, it would have been... Well, what time of day was that? I would have thought I'd already changed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there's not a time stamp on it because there's so many posts. Um, but I want to say it's, it looks to be about dusk. So that would have been 7 30, 8 o'clock. I guess that changed when I got back to the house. When an innocent witness is asked a question which they cannot answer, they are usually comfortable admitting they do not know. 
Guilty suspects, however, are more likely to reply with a speculative answer to please the detectives and appear helpful. This can be seen when Alex says, I guess I got changed when I got back to the house. Earlier when, earlier when we spoke, <clears throat> and you talked about waking up from your nap and going to check on your mother, and you tried to call Maggie, and you tried to call Paul, and then you uh, sent, him or sent Maggie a text that you were going to check on your mother. You also told me that Maggie didn't normally go with you to check on your mother, but that she might, might, might ride that night. Did you go by and check on her? Go by and check on my mom? Maggie, before you left to go? No, I didn't. With her not responding to you, um, and thinking that she might ride with you, why didn't you? I, I don't, I don't uh, remember having plans that Maggie was going to ride with me. Um, but maybe she had told me that she was that night. I, I don't, I don't recall that. I don't remember that specifically, but, um, I mean, it wasn't, she didn't normally go with me. I mean, it's not like we had plans that she was going to ride with me, but if she was going, um, How often did you go visit your mother that night? I mean, it, it wasn't infrequent. Okay. It wasn't all the time. I mean, visit her, you know, all times of day. Yeah. Just checking on her, especially with your dad being sorry. She had been having a particularly, you know, she's got Alzheimer's really bad or pretty bad. And she had been particularly agitated. Um, you know, with him not being there. And, uh, checked on her <coughs> more in the days and weeks following my dad's passing then you know otherwise but several times a week you know any any time how long would you say you were at your mom's that night 45 minutes an hour and you have to go back home Did you make any stops on the way On the way there? On the way to your mom's or on your return trip back home? Stops. Um, no, I didn't go anywhere. I went straight there. I did not. No, sir. Okay. I mean, earlier in the day when you were down at the, at the shed in the kennels with um, Paul, did y'all discuss any injuries to any dogs? Did he and I? No, but Rogan Gibson told me about um, the dog's tail and somebody saying his leg was broken. Stop it, please. Which one was his dog? When you got back to Moselle, which driveway did you make? I went in the, I went in the brick gates. Maggie and Paul weren't there. Were, were there vehicles at the house? Yes, sir. How did they get down there that night? I still, I was hoping you were going to be able to tell me that. The only thing that I can come up with is that black truck. Is that Buster's old black truck? Yes, sir. Does it normally stay down at the farm or does it stay at the house? Both. 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 Um, did Maggie ever walk down there? Maggie walked down there a lot. But Paul, I mean, I just, it would, 
it would sh if, if you showed me some proof that Paul walked down there that night, I would be surprised. Absolutely surprised. Well, thinking about Paul's health concerns, do you think maybe he could have gotten him to walk that night? So come on, let's walk with me this one time. You know, it's possible, but again, that would be highly, highly unusual. He would have talked her in the ride. <laughs> been highly unusual for him to walk. <clears throat> So when you were at the kennels, um, you were just down there with Paul. And you left and went back to the house for dinner. You know, I mean, Paul and I were just knocking around up at the shop, the shed, the kennels, and the, you know, just the whole property. And and that was before dinner, yes, sir. And you didn't go back down there after dinner until you returned truck from visiting your mother. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I've got information that Paul was on the phone and Maggie was heard in the background and you were heard in the background. The information that the detectives alluded to is a video uploaded to Paul's social media account. Get back. Get back. Quit, Cash. Come on. Quit. It's okay. Come here. Come here, Cash. Come here. Post it. Cash. Bubba. Hey, Bubba. It's a guinea. This is a chicken. Come here, Bubba. Come here, Cash. Come here, Bubba. Cash. Quit. The video places Alex at the scene of the murders at 8.44 p.m., only four minutes before coroners believe the murders took place. It can be assumed that an innocent person would view this news as positive as it means they may have a new lead. Alex doesn't show any of these traits and instead appears defensive. The lack of conviction in his answers is likely a result of Alex not wanting to be certain in case the evidence catches him in a lie. And that was prior to that. Yeah. I, I heard Rogan Gibson ask me if I was up there. He said he thought it was me. Was it you? At, at 9 o'clock? Yes, sir. No, sir. Not if my times are right. Who do you think it could have been? I have no idea. And Rogan's been around your family for pretty much all of his life. Oh, absolutely. And he recognizes your voice and you have a distinct voice. anybody else that has a voice similar to yours that he may have um, misinterpreted? No. No, sir. I mean, he, I mean, he had told me that he thought I was up there. Didn't that surprise him? Yes, sir. When you return back to the kennels, when you return home from your mom's, um, were there, where were the dogs? They were like they were when, long I didn't put dogs up. Okay. So, so they, they weren't running loose? However they were. Okay. At one point in the 911 call, um, you say here like you're talking to somebody else or something else. I say here? Here, yes sir. So the dispatcher is asking you um, if they're breathing 
and you said no. And she asked if you did you see anyone else in the area, and you said no. She asked about guns near them, and you said no. And then you kind of stutter and start moving around, and you said here. I don't have any memory of saying that. I guess I'd have to listen to it, to, uh, you know, but I don't recall the dog being out. I'm certain that there was not a dog out. Um, you know, I mean, there's other things people have told me about that 911 call that I don't remember. Um, I, I don't know here. Like I was calling a dog. Calling a dog, talking to somebody else. I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Yes, sir. And, I mean, that obviously there was nobody else out there. Okay. And I'm, I'm certain that there was not a dog loose. So during the 911 call, <clears throat> and we also talked about talked about that this night. That night, you returned back to the house to get a shotgun. Yes, sir. What door did you enter? The best that I can remember, I went in the side door, um, and I went straight to the gun cabinet. Were you focused on any particular shotgun, or you just grabbed one? I just grabbed one. How do you normally load your shotguns? Abbott hunters load shotguns in special ways, um, different types of munitions. Um, and I'm just seeing how, asking you how you load yours. I mean, I normally put it in the chamber and, uh, and push the button. What types, what, what type of shot? Do you load all kinds? I mean, I've loaded bird shot, buck shot, slugs, and, skeet and shot. At the same time, I mean, would you would you load like a, a bird shot and a buck shot in the same load? Not not normally. I mean, normally you put them in, you know, a load for whatever you're hunting. Mm -hmm. reason I'm asking about that, <clears throat> the shot shells that we recovered that night, one was a turkey load, one was a buckshot. I understood that. The shotgun that you had with you that night, there was a bird shot and a buckshot. Uh, when Jeff went back the next day, um, I'm not sure which attorney it was, pointed out that there had been a shotgun laying on the pool table that he had put away and pointed out that ammunition that was with that and it was a buckshot and a birdshot. And then the shotgun that we took um, for potential comparison, it was also loaded with a birdshot and a buckshot. So I have all of these consistent loads along with what's that? in the feed room. I call it the feed room at the kennels. Is that what you call it? That's, that's okay. fucking good enough. Okay. I just want, if I say feed room, I just want you to know what I'm talking about. The night I grabbed the shells that I could get my hands on, I, 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 I don't, you know, I had no idea exactly what I had. Okay. And, and that's, you know, we, we've talked about the shot shells. So the cartridge casings were 300 blackout cartridge casings that were found by Mac. There were also cartridge casings found by your house, by the side door to the gun room, and at the shoot, shooting range. And the ones by the house and some of the ones found at the shoot range are confirmed matches to the ones found by Maggie. Okay. So, which gives another concern. I've got the same load as the shot shells. 
and multiple guns and 300 blackout that match one found on your property. So you now believe that those guns, that Paul's guns were used? Yes. Okay. And missing. Another part in the 911 call, um, you made the comment, I should have known. And the question that surrounded um, you know, dispatchers asking, is anybody else supposed to be at the house? Um, and you said, no ma'am, please hurry. Um, and she says, we're getting somebody out there to you. And your next comment was, I should have known. What are you referencing in that statement? I don't remember saying that, but I guess, you know, all the threats and, you know, and I had been convinced that this was something to do with the boat wreck and, you know, all of that. physical with you? Ever get into a heated argument and get physical? One time, I mean, a, a little bit where he wouldn't listen to me. Did you ever get physical with him? No, sir. How about Maggie and Paul get physical with Maggie? No. Yeah. Sure, she probably wanted to at times. I mean, no, she, she wanted to with all of us. Yeah. The one time Paul did that, he had had too much to drink mm -hmm. um, in a very isolated incident. Where was that? Was that at Moselle or at a stove? That was at uh, Moselle. So that was pretty recent? No, sir. It had been a while. One thing that I'm trying to understand is your timeline. You said you probably went to the office at 30, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and you left early around 5 or 5.30. Um, and there's been some other timelines or times that we've talked about, and you can't quite remember um, what the times are or what time of day it was. When the dispatcher asked you when was the last time you saw Maggie or talked to Maggie, you said an hour and a half, two hours ago. To me, that's, you know, a set, without thinking about it, you should route it off that time. Um, we're sitting here trying to figure out a timeline, and you're having trouble coming up with a specific time. Oh, man, it's there. Uh, I don't, uh, I, tell me again what I said to the um, dispatcher. Alex's body language allows a viewer the unique opportunity to look inside his mind. His hands and arms are locked together and placed just above his sensitive areas, suggesting he is in a defensive and paranoid mental state. Another interesting detail is the tight grip he has around his arm and the way his other hand is clenched. This implies extreme mental duress. An innocent interviewee in a case as large as this will almost always experience a modicum of anxiety. However, it is unlikely to be this large and have an effect as profound as this. You said an hour and a half ago, probably two hours. And what time was that? That was when you were on the phone uh, when the 911 call was made at 10.06. So given two hours back, that would have been eight. I mean, I think that's probably about, I think that's probably about right. And so you, what do you believe I'm giving you an inconsistent answer? No, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it when I'm asking you what time you went to the office that day, what time you got home. You're, you know, you said five or 5.30. I've gotten the card read out from the law firm and it shows you going in at 5, 5.30.
You going in the door? Yes, sir. And Randy says when he left about six o'clock, you were still there. So the times aren't matching up. And I'm just trying to get an, I, under, I'm, I'm just trying to get an understanding of why. I believe I left. So the, the, that's not the first time I was at my office that day. There were several readings, but your card wouldn't work. Somebody had to actually had to let you in. Okay. But, I, but I've got your card opening a door at the law firm at 5.30. And then Randy saying when he left at six, you were still there. I'm just I'm trying to understand. You know, we've already established family guns were used. And if they came from Paul's truck, Paul's truck was at the house. So where where were they? And how did they get down there? How did they get down there? I mean, it, it's normal for y'all to leave your keys in the cars. However, if somebody showed up and did this, you're not gonna take Paul's truck back to the house and leave the key in it. And do you know that the, the guns were in the truck? I mean, could they have been somewhere else? Did y'all get any kind of forensic off of anything that y'all found? The, just the rain and the... Yeah. I mean, we, we got plenty of DNA from the scene, but... Yeah. It's Nolan's, it's Rogan's, it's Alex, it's Paul's, it's Maggie's, it's Buster's. Everybody's yeah. David, can you tell me for sure? Um, did either one of them live after they were shot the first time? Not at all. Just heavy. The, the shooting happened very quickly. Very quick. Is this one person, two persons, three persons? Two guns. I've got two different types of ammunition. It's hard to say. It is hard to say. Now, did neither one of them suffer very long? A matter of seconds. If that. that really makes you think, hey, this is a good... We know, like I said, the only DNA we have are family and close friends. Um, we don't have any fingerprints. We don't have, unfortunately, we don't have any shoe wear or tire wear impressions because it rained that night. Thing, the only thing that we can go off of are the cell tower dumps or um, I know the FBI was out and they were out on your property on Friday riding around trying to get some cell phone data. Unfortunately, all of that takes time. And y'all, now y'all had to send the, because his vehicle's new, you had to send that off? Yes, sir. So it's not <clears> like <throat> when we hire experts and they come in and just download it it's 2021 and they don't have the systems for it yet gotcha. but they're working near creating the system from, <laughs> what, from what i understand okay hmm. now i don't know exactly how the on start thing works i know how the control module works, <coughs> but, but we're this is something different right or is it all <coughs> contained in the same thing there, there there are two different systems that we took out yeah um one is on star and the other one is the telemetry system or M infotainment center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the FBI says there is information there. Yeah. They just have to be able to extract it and put it in a report. Sure. Okay. Um, so you I, just I, wait for yes, that? I'm waiting. Um, I'm waiting on the search warrant from um, OnStar okay. um, to see what kind of information they can give me. Good. Um, there's, you need a if bus signing something expedites that. Mm -hmm. 
told you we'll yeah, get. I, 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 I don't own the car, but whoever yeah. we need to will sign whatever authorization you need. Because I, I, let me tell you what I've tried not to do. I know y'all have to look at me. I tried to have as little discussions with the people that y'all are interviewing. You know, with all this talk about how I fixed this and fixed that with the boat wreck, which is totally untrue. You know, I've tried to not have a lot of conversation with people that, you know, I know y'all need to talk to. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, do you have any more questions that I might be able to answer? In, uh, if you can't think of any now, reach out, call me. I will know. I mean, you've answered a lot of things I had questions about, and I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll call the Bramstetters and see if they want to meet. Um, maybe get married up there at the same time so I can just meet with them all together. Does Marion, I know they live on the Wamba Law, does Marion work? No, she doesn't work. And they're, you know, they're kind of between Wadma Law and, I mean, they're residents of the state of Florida, but okay. they're, they're here as much as they, but they're in Greenville a lot right now. Yeah, because it's grand baby. The baby, that's right. Okay. Thank you, man. Yeah. I just Thank saw you. a few more questions. Okay. Did you kill Maggie? No. Did I kill my wife? Yes, sir. No, David. Do you know who did? No, I do not know who did. Alex's denial appears completely monotone throughout. An authentic denial, however, would usually vary in pitch as a result of the emotion that comes hand in hand. The lack of emotion in this moment is alarming as usually there would be at least a semblance of anger or outrage at being put on the spot like this. Not only because you are being accused of murdering your closest relatives, but also because it implies their attention has shifted away from the real perpetrator. Did you kill Paul? No, I did not kill Paul. Do you know who did? No, sir, I do not know who did. Do you think I killed Maggie? I have to go where the evidence and the facts take me. I understand that. And you think I killed Paul? I have to go where the evidence and the facts take me, and I don't have anything that points to anybody else at this time. So does that mean that I am a suspect? You were still in, like I told Corey earlier, you were still in this. With, with, it, with everything that we've talked about, with the family guns, the ammunition, nobody else's DNA. I have to put my beliefs aside and go with the facts. The detectives would continue to explore the avenue that Alex may be the perpetrator, finding a range of damning evidence. Alex's phone would place him at the scene of the murder at 9.06 p.m. What suddenly happens to Alex's phone around 9.02? Pretty much wakes up. And what data point is reflected? From 9.02.18 p.m. to 9.06.47, it shows 283 steps traveled. And how long? How many minutes, roughly? Five minutes. Five, six minutes and vehicle data would show a large speed increase on his way to his mother's. This was at the exact same location that Maggie's phone would be found a few days later. Okay. So what is, what does this depict? Uh, this is a graph of the speed of Mr. Murdoch's Suburban, and this is from the trip from Moselle to his parents' house. And that would be on the night of June 7th? Yes, and each one of those little vertical lines, the blue lines, represents three seconds. So as he drove past, I think you've testified that, where Maggie's cell phone was thrown out on the side of the road, tell us approximately what he was doing. Was he accelerating, decelerating, stopping? What was he doing? He was speeding up. So he's speeding up from, you know, 42, 43, 44, 45 miles per hour as he goes through that area. Interestingly, a garden hose was left untied and vast amounts of water was found on the ground. The kennel master claims the water was in an irregular place and was not there when he left earlier that day. 
The prosecution would suggest Alex used the hose to clean the blood from his person. Dale, are you able to see the water located near the feed room and in front of the, the two kennels, one and two? Yes. Is that how water would normally pool when you washed the kennels for four years? Normally, no. The most incriminating piece of evidence, however, came in the form of Alex's blue jacket. Large amounts of gunshot residue was found in the hood of this jacket. The prosecution argued that the murder weapons were wrapped in this jacket before being disposed of. So typically when we're looking for gunshot primer residue, we're looking for somebody who was in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm. Uh, for this particular case, uh, we were provided uh, information that something might have been transferred in this item that had gunshot primer residue on it. Therefore, we treated it like an item that needed to be checked for transfer. Therefore, we had to collect particle lifts from the entirety of the item, including the interior. You can either do it from up there or down here. How did you do it? How did you do it? What did you start with? Collecting potential particle lifts or particle lifts. So, in total, we collected 25 particle lifts from the jacket. Based off of this evidence, Alex would be arrested and taken to trial. The trial is largely available for public viewing. The jury would hear evidence from both parties. However, perhaps the most interesting part of the trial was when Alex himself took to the stand. Due to the large amounts of evidence against Alex, the defense opted to appeal to the jury's human side. They utilized the horrific details of the crime and emphasized Alex's loving family man facade. This can be seen in their questions to Alex. I'm Alec Murdoch, M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H. Good morning. On June 7th, 2021, did you take this gun or any gun like it and shoot your son Paul in the chest in the feed room at your property off Moselle Road? No, I did not. Mr. Murdy, did you take this gun or any gun like it and blow your son's brains out on June 7th or any day or any time? No, I did not. Mr. Murray, if you take a 300 blackout such as this and fire it into your wife Maggie's leg, torso, or any part of her body. No, I did not. Did you shoot a 300 blackout into her head, causing her death? Mr. Griffin, I didn't shoot my wife or my son any time. Ever. <clears throat> Mr. Murdoch, is that you? On the kennel video at 8.44 p.m. on June 7th, the night Maddie, Maggie and Paul were murdered. It is. Were you in fact at the kennels at 8.44 p.m. on the night Maggie and Paul were murdered? I was. Did you lie to Sled Agent Owen and Deputy Laura Rutland on the night of June 7th and told them that you stayed at the house after dinner? I did lie to them. Did you lie to Agent Owen and Agent Croft on the follow-up interview on June 10th that the last time you saw Maggie and Paul was at dinner? I did lie to them. And in the interview of August 11th, did you tell Agent Owen and Agent Craw, did you lie to them t by telling them that you were not down at the kennels on that night? Yes. Alec, why did you lie to Agent Owen, Agent Croft, and Deputy Rutland about the last time you saw Maggie and Paul? As my addiction evolved over time, I would get in these situations or circumstances where I would get paranoid thinking. Uh, and it, it could be anything that, that triggered it. It might be a look somebody gave me. It might be a reaction somebody had to something I did. Um, it might be a policeman following me in, in a car. 
Um, that night, June 7th, after finding Mags and Paul, Papa. This is the first time Alex has referred to his son via this nickname throughout this whole case. Many argue that this is just another strategy to gain sympathy from the jury and promote his loving father disguise. Don't talk to anybody without Danny with you. All my partners were just repeatedly telling me that. I had a deputy sheriff taking gunshot test from my hands. I'm sitting in a police car with David Owen asking me about my relationship with my wife and my son. And all those things coupled together after finding them, coupled with my distrust for SLED, caused me to have paranoid thoughts. Normally, when these paranoid thoughts would hit me, I could take a deep breath real quick and just think about it, reason my way through it, and just get past it really quickly. On June the 7th, I wasn't thinking clearly. I don't think I was capable of reason. And I lied about being down there. And I'm so sorry that I did. I'm sorry to my son Buster. I'm sorry to Grandma and Papa T. I'm sorry to both of our families. Most of all, I'm sorry to Mags and Paul Paul. I would never intentionally do anything to hurt either one of them. Ever. Ever. And were you and Paul having a good time at that point? You could not be around Paul Paul. You could not be around him and not have a good time. Were you, were you close to Paul? You couldn't be any closer. Then Paul Paul and I and Buster and I were in awe. He's just a wonderful, wonderful. And it's one of the things you enjoyed doing together was just riding the property? I love doing anything with Paul Paul. It was an absolute delight. The prosecution would present a strong case supported by a large amount of evidence and witness testimony. They would also attempt to discredit Alex's facade by questioning him on his financial misdeeds and showing evidence of his previous deceit. Cross-examination. Please, court. Mr. Murdoch, let's start with a few things I think we can agree on. All right, sir. You agree that the most important part of your testimony here today is explaining your lie for a year and a half that you were never down at those kennels at 844. Would you agree with that? I, I think all of my testimony is important, Mr. Waters. Would you agree that that's an important part of your testimony? Sure. All right. And would you also agree that the first time that law enforcement officers that you've talked to and the prosecution and here in open court ever heard you say that you lied about being in the kennels was today in this court? Yes, I'm aware of that. You would agree with that? Yes, sir. All, right. All this time later, this is the first time you've ever said that? Yes, sir. 
And you would agree to me, with me that for years you were stealing money from clients. Yes, sir, I agree with that. And that you were stealing from your law firm. Yes, sir, I agree with that. And that had been going on since at least 2010. I'm not sure of the exact date, but it's been going on a long time. I'll agree with All that. All right, what's your best guess of the date? I'm not sure. I, I, have, you don't I, I don't take a dispute with 2010. I just don't know that for sure. All right. I'm sure about a lot of things, but you don't know that. Is that correct? I, I'm fine with that date, Mr. Okay. Waters. I, I don't have any reason to dispute it. I'm just not certain of it. These were real people you were dealing with, right? Absolutely. They were, I, you know I what? know you want to give that answer, but these were real people, aren't they? No, nah, they're very real people. And, you know, one of the saddest parts of this whole thing is, is, you know, they're people that I, I, I still care about, and I did them this way. You know, that's what I was meaning in that text that you made an issue about to Annette Griswold, and, and it was a lot talking about my partners, but it was a lot talking about these people. I mean, I know the people that I did wrong and that I hurt and that I stole from. I mean, they're people that I think a lot of. And they didn't know hang on, hang on, I, I wanna say one more thing. And there's no question that the actions that I did, the things that I did wrong, hurt a lot of the people that I care about the most. And I did a lot of damage. And I wreaked a lot of ha havoc. That I'm, a lot of damage and wreaked a lot of havoc. I hear you. There's no question right, let me, about it. Uh, i show you what's been marked as States 315. See if you recognize that. I do. Which case is this? This is Elise Mallory. This line of questioning showcases Alex's warped moral compass and his ability to hurt those closest to him. And what happened in this case? I stole her money. What happened, though, with the underlying case? Can you tell the jury that? Do you remember that? Um. I believe Ms. it was Miss Taylor, uh, Miss Mallory's. I believe it was her daughter. It might have been her granddaughter, but I believe it was her daughter. Mm -hmm. Was uh, in a wreck. Did she die? And she got killed. And Miss Mallory came to you for help. She did. You remember that one I at do. all? I okay. Remember. okay, we remember one now. Oh no, Mr. Waters, I remember all of these people. Okay. I, it's not that I don't remember them. Uh -huh. You're just asking me details about conversations. Okay, great. I, I, I can promise you, I remember all of these people that I did wrong. All right, and you stole all of the money, didn't you? I, st I, st I stole all of, all of the money. Most, most of the money that I've been accused of stealing, I stole. No, I mean, you stole every single dime of the recovery. She didn't get one dime. Isn't that right? I have to look at the records, but if you that's... You credited what... yourself with legal fees, and then you stole all the rest of the money, correct? I, I don't dispute that. If, all right. If you tell me about, first of all, tell me about Miss Malley. So she lost her daughter, correct? Is that correct? That is correct. And she came to you for help, daughter, is that correct? granddaughter, but... All right. One. All right. And she came to you for help, correct? Yes, sir, I agree with you on that. Very, very sweet lady, correct? Very sweet lady. All right. Tell me about your conversation when you looked her in the eye and lied to her while you were stealing every dime of the money. That's, this is a perfect example, Mr. Waters. I stole her money. I did her wrong. But I don't even believe that Elise Mallory was there when I stole that money. I don't, if you look at that disbursement sheet, there's, I, I, I don't even believe I ever sh showed that to her. You don't remember having any conversations with her when you lied with her about this case while you were stealing all her money? I don't think I did in this case. I don't think I had any meetings with her. I think I stole her money, and I don't believe that I had a meeting with her. So, again, you can't tell us one conversation you have with any of these people when you looked them in the eye and convinced them 
that you were doing them right, that you were telling the truth. That's not true, Mr. Waters. I remember a lot of those conversations. I remember a lot of them. All right, you just testified you remember a lot of them. I've been asking you now for the past 10 minutes to tell me about one of them where it's stuck in your heart. There are a lot it's of stuck in your brain. There are a lot of conversations I had where I misled my clients and I stole their money. Mr. Ward, if you keep making the issue about the first time I you hearing these things, when when I got arrested and I went to jail, we began reaching out to you to talk to you about all of these things, to try to tell you everything that I had done, to give you all these details, to help y'all go through these financial things. And up until the time that y'all charged me with murdering my wife and child, you would never uh, give Jim Griffin a response to our invitations to sit down and meet with you. So you're telling so, me I never responded to Jim Griffin? Is that what you're saying here today? I'm telling you. Are you saying that you ever before yesterday reached out to anyone through yourself or through your attorneys and reached out to anyone in law enforcement or the prosecution and told them the story about the kennels? Are you telling me that? I'm, what I'm telling you, you, Answer my Mr. question Waters? first, please, sir. Answer my question first. Did you ever reach out to anyone in law enforcement or the prosecution and tell that story that you told this jury yesterday about the kennels before yesterday? Did I ever reach out to law enforcement you, to say, I want to tell you about the kennels? No, sir, I did not. What this I, is the Fifth Amendment line. Pardon? This questioning about him volunteering information on these charges violates his Fifth Amendment rights, and we strongly object. Any more, we have to make a motion. He brought it up. Objections overruled. What I did was so answer yet, my question first. Yeah, you know, for the record, he did not bring it. He was talking about financial stuff. Down, Mr. Um, he was, Griffin. Yes or no question. Before yesterday, did you ever bring up what you told this jury about that kennels? To anybody in the prosecution or anybody in law enforcement? No. I Mr. Murdoch, is the reason why no one's ever heard that before is because you had to sit in this courtroom and hear your family and your friends, one after the other, come in and testify that you were on that kennel video. So you, like you've done so many times over the course of your life, had to back up and make a new story that kind of fit with the facts that can't be denied. Isn't that true, sir? No, sir, that's not true. Okay. You've done that over and over again over the years with all of this that we've been talking about, haven't you? I've done what over and over again? The second that you're confronted with facts that you can't deny, you immediately come up with a new lie. Isn't that correct? Mr. Waters, have we established I have lied many times, but I can't sit here and tell you that, you, what are you talking about, facts that I can't deny? that. I, I, I would disagree with that proposition that you're putting out that that was what I did all the time. But in, in doing that, I admit again that I have lied to people that trusted me. So we can agree that the prosecution and law enforcement and so many of your friends and family heard for the first time your story about the kennels yesterday after all these weeks of testimony. Can we agree on that? That law enforcement, mm -hmm. my partners, and my friends heard me say that for the first time. Yes, I agree with that. you agree with me that your own lawyer was repeating your story that you were at home napping as late as November of 22 on national television I don't I don't know you don't know that no, in jail, we don't, we don't get newspapers, and 
the, the TV we have is limited, so. So your own lawyers, at least as late as November 22, didn't know this story that you've told to this jury after five weeks of your family and friends coming in and saying, yeah, that's him on that video. Uh, I don't objection, know. your honor, violates attorney-client privilege communication. Totally improper. Yes, totally improper. Yes, sir, in response. He uh, has brought up his communications with counsel, and now I, that is fair game, your honor. His communications through counsel with, or alleged communications with the prosecution. He didn't. There's no attorney-client privilege to national television interviews. The objection is overruled. Are you waiting for me to answer, Mr. Waters, or did I answer? Uh, I, I think the point's made. All right, sir. As you may have gathered, the trial did not go as Alex expected, and the evidence spoke for itself, consequently meaning the jury would return a guilty verdict on four counts. These include the murder of Maggie, the murder of Paul, and two counts of possession of a weapon during a crime. The following day, Alex was handed a life sentence for his crimes. This sentence is likely to increase as Alex has a second trial in the near future. This is to determine the extent of his financial crimes. Alex still protests his innocence even after his guilty verdict.